The first thing I would do is the trade short S&P against gold on a ratio basis. More 1.5 times S&P to one unit of not just gold, gold, palladium, and stuff like that. As I said, what I call gold is not what you call gold. What I call gold has more silver, palladium, other intelligent metals that central banks don't own than gold, right? Because you know what's going to happen. They're going to dump their gold on us, for us, you see, when, when, when things will go quite bad. So the first trade is S&P versus gold with more short S&P. That's the first big trade. Second big trade I would do is expressed with out-of-the-money option a very small probability of making money but boy if you're right boy you will never see a private plane a, a, a public plane again if you if, if you get that right is hyperinflation right and no bet on inflation hyperinflation something that may explode if they print because of expectations some out-of-the-money option that's the second trade I know I'm gonna lose money on it but boy if I win it's be big the third trade is a no-brainer. Every single human being should have that trade. It's short treasury bill, uh, bonds in the U.S. Short the curve. Yes. Yeah, but out of money options on what? Ah, the, 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 I have about 18 different uh, instruments. I, I, I build them as a cocktail that one would hyperventilate. Out of the money calls on gold because of the yes. liquid, uh, silver, uh, way out of the money puts on treasury bonds, because that's the yes, best way to get it, stuff like that. Okay. So um, I have bet on inflation or deficit, another one on hyperinflation, not bet on inflation. I don't care about inflation. Hyperinflation, small possibility. Um, and of course, they're, they're like, it's a standard, okay? You have cocktail of way out of the money in, in commodities, cocktail of way out of the money in fixed income. And then a trade that I think that no, that, that even you have, Ron, okay, that nobody should, should avoid having on is go short U.S. Treasury bonds. So long as you see the picture of Larry Summers in Davos, going to Davos, you got to keep staying short the Treasury bonds in the U.S. for another year. That's my rule, right? It means they don't know what's going on, right? So long as you see the picture of... Uh, you, you remind, every time you see the picture of what's his name Bernanke and he still has that job you got to make sure run to make sure your position is you know active that you are short you you benefit from rise in long-term rates in the US okay so long as these two guys are in office that's that's the trade and then the other residual trades are of course uh, uh, you know uh, Possibility of a breakup of Europe, small probability, but there are some instruments that help you with that. So, perfect. I think you're shorting the bonds to Hugh. Yeah. No, no, he's, he copied the trade last night. We explained no. Hugh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. it's up okay. to you okay. now. Okay. Now, I'm going to stand up. Okay, this is why I don't get invited to Davos, and I'm going to start telling you some truth. Okay. Um, so I, I have to apologize, first of all. I suffer from Tourette's. Um, my Tourette's, I'm too honest. Sometimes I use bad language, and my metaphors get all mixed up and typically sexual. So forgive me if any of those things pop out. Um, I think the big, the big economic issue was written by John Maynard Keynes in 1921, the economic implications of the peace, the economic consequences of the peace. And his point was that the, the victorious allies had imposed this, this demand that Germany repay so much debt. And it's a bit like today because Germany had to repay one times its GDP but in gold. And clearly we see that in places like Greece today. The, the euro is a gold standard. The problem of Greece is that its liabilities are in gold and that's why ultimately it will default. So the economic consequences of the peace, I want to talk about the economic consequences of the bailout. The problem with the bailout of 2008 and, and the first quarter of 2009 is that it, it did nothing to eliminate the debt. The debt is just unprecedented in the Western world. As previous panels have, have gone on to mention, we've had a tripling in leverage for the last 30 years. That tripling of leverage 
when it's gone through the prism of a real asset such as the stock market has produced unprecedented gains. The British stock market up 43 times in nominal terms, the S&P up 25 times. This is unprecedented. We could have lived for 300 years and we would never have seen this, this period. And it's left many people still hunger, hungry for risk. I don't have that, that hunger. So if Mark gave me that $100 million, I would reduce my management fee from 2 to 1%. But I still charge a performance fee. And, and I would have a portfolio um, inspired by Nassim. But I can, I can be more informative about this notion of, of risk than perhaps the Grand Master is willing to do. Um, I, I, I have a portfolio today, and what I want to say to you is, after two days of being at this wonderful conference, I am fed up with other people's opinions. <laughs> Quite frankly, other people's opinions suck, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and remember, I mean, I sit alone in London, um, in the western part of London, away from the hedge fund guys, who are just so uncool. Um, I sit and I, I promise you, I get no telephone call from a stockbroker. None. I don't read any research. Right? So perhaps you might want to dismiss anything I say. But this, this, is, this is being torturous. My point to you is, who cares about anyone's opinion? You pay money for what they do with that opinion. And what I've gone on to do, again, feeding this legacy of debt, feeling that it's this dead weight upon all of our shoulders, that it's bound to squeeze all of the vitality out of our entrepreneurs, the real money makers, the real risk takers in the economy. Um, I'm feeling quite depressed. Now, the joy is I don't have to spend Mark's 100 million. I only have to spend a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of it. Um, in the UK, we have interest rates which are at a 300-year low. In fact, more than that, since the Bank of England was conceived in 1692. I, can you believe, I get paid money every day underwriting the risk that the Bank of England will cut rates further. I don't get paid a lot, but I get paid a little bit. And I take on a risk, a tail risk. And I've got to have an assessment of that tail risk. But in return, I use that to cheapen an option which says, I don't think the Bank of England and indeed I do this trade in, 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 in the euro as well, I don't think these central bankers are going to raise rates over the next four months. And if nothing happens, I make five times my money. Quite a good trade. If they raise rates, I lose my premium. I'll tell you exactly what my premium is. It's not a lot. I can live. I'll survive that. On the other side of my book, I've discovered, I think, something which is close to the pulse and trade in the CDOs um, in U.S. mortgages in 2005 and 2006. Can you believe that a trade with that kind of dynamic exists today? Can you believe that if nothing happens and I'm just wrong, then again I will lose 1.5% in a year? But if I'm right, I'll make 75%? That trade exists today, and maybe later on I'll tell you about it. Thank you very much.